Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to MOS Live for our live animal presentation on this fine Friday afternoon. My name is Karen. I'm one of the many educators at Museum of Science, and today I'll sort of be acting as your moderator. All that means is that I will be keeping an eye out on the Q&A box for any of your observations, your questions, your comments uh, as you are watching our live animal show. Now here on Zoom, if you do want to share something or ask a question, you can click the Q&A button, type it on in and send it out and I will see it and relay it to our live animal center staff. If you are on Facebook or YouTube, we love that you are tuning in today. Unfortunately, we cannot field questions or comments from those two platforms. And lastly, before we get started, if you do need captioning, you can click CC button and choose show subtitles. But with that, I think we should jump right in and find out who we're meeting today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Corey. I'm the invertebrate keeper here at the museum. And with me today is Liz, who is our assistant curator of our live animal center. So today we're going to be talking about unique defenses. And we have a wide range of animals to show you guys today. Our first animal that we're gonna see is pretty cool. And if you've seen our shows in the past, you definitely have seen this one before, but it was many, many months ago. So I'm gonna have Liz just jump right in and show us our animal. So these are white spotted assassin bugs and their name holds very true. You can see they have white spots and these guys are assassins. So these guys, have a rostrum, that's their mouth. It's like a straw. So when they find their prey, they take that straw and they pierce it into their prey, release venom in a digestive enzyme that liquefies the prey on the inside and then they suck it out like a milkshake. They also use this venom to uh, protect themselves from predators. So while venom is not a unique defense, the ability that these animals are able to use venom in so many ways to protect themselves is super, super cool because they also use their venom to hunt their prey. So white spotted assassin bugs are from Western Africa. They tend to be in tropical regions and they live in groups in trees and on stumps. Um, kind of closer to the forest floor. These are ambush predators, so they kind of sit and wait for their prey to come. And as adults, they tend to eat um, insects or um, smaller, very small vertebrates on their own. As when they're little though, they'll actually work together to take down larger prey because they are so, so tiny when they come out of their eggs. So you might have heard me call these guys white spotted assassin bugs. And that's because these guys are true bugs. In our everyday language, we tend to call all insects bugs, but there are actually not all insects are bugs, but all bugs are insects. That's a tongue twister for you, huh? So these guys are true bugs um, with that nice rostrum to help them eat. So here at the museum, these guys get crickets it's one of their favorite meals and they get a lot of them. Each individual needs at least one cricket every feeding, if not more. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over and see if we have any questions about white spotted assassins or defenses within invertebrates. Well, I am really impressed. I just learned a whole lot about what these guys are. I didn't know bug was a true category of insect, which is kind of cool. Um, but we do have a bunch of questions coming in. So let's hop right on to those. Um, Somebody wanted to know, aren't assassin bugs also called kissing bugs? Yes, yeah, so that is another name for assassin bugs as well. It does um, tend to, kissing bugs does tend to kind of focus on a specific type of assassin bug. So when we say assassin bug, that actually is a huge group of, of species of invertebrates, of insects. So these guys, um, kissing bug is another one, but also that falls under the same category are, because we have assassin bugs here in the United States and here that live in our, in our area in New England. But a lot of those guys tend to, they use their, um, it's also called a proboscis, their mouthpiece to um, suck from different plants. 
So they're not all uh, carnivores or insectivores. Some of them are actually herbivores that use that piercing sucking mouthpiece to get out the sap or any juices inside of plants. Yeah, that's a great observation. Cool. So Emmy and Hensley, who are seven, want to know how old are these bugs and how long do they live? And I think there are a couple of other folks that asked a similar question. Great, great question. So these guys, once they're adults, live for about a year. Now, what's super interesting is that new research keeps coming out all the time and we're learning more and more. So some research says that these guys can actually live up to two years as adults, while other places say one year. We have found that under our care, these guys usually live about a year. Um, and it takes these guys about four months to reach adulthood. So it's pretty quick. Once they lay an egg, that egg can hatch within 14 days. So I have to clean their, their home every other week. So that way we know that we're not having babies on exhibit because could you imagine really teeny tiny little assassin bugs running around their exhibit? Oh my gosh, that just sounds like a nightmare waiting to happen. Do they hatch out as bugs rather than having a larval stage, Corey? So that's oh, a Karen question. <laughs> that is literally, that is such a great question. Um, so yes, Karen, they do. So these guys do not, they go through incomplete metamorphosis. So they are an egg, a smaller version of themselves that then grows and molts over time into the adult version. These guys actually go through five in stars. So that means they're born, they molt. That's one stage. They molt and second stage, they molt third stage. And that's kind of how we track, we track insect growth is through their instars or the amount of times they molt. And that's a really good indicator. And most insects stick to an exact set of molts, which is really interesting. Maybe Liz can help us out. Somebody was asking how big they are. So I don't know if Liz has a free hand to kind of put it up next to them just to give a, a sense of scale. Yeah. So it's like, a little like first long. Yeah, so it's a little hard because Liz's hand is in front of the enclosure and they're a little bit behind. So you get a little bit of perspective there, but they are about the size of my thumb. So a little over an inch. They're not huge by any means. If you put it on your hand, it would just fit right, right in the center there. These guys, when we do work with them, Liz actually has safety gear right next to her. So she's able to pick up uh, leather gloves and tongs just in case anything were to go wrong. Because while these guys, again, use their venom and their sucking mouth parts to eat, they also use it as a defense mechanism. So they can take that, put it into your skin. It's called a bite. They'll put it into your skin. And from what I've heard, it's never happened to me before. But what I hear is it's like a really, really, really horrible bee sting. Like it is more painful than a bee sting. Apparently it's not, not fun. These guys can also spray their venom. So if they're feeling like you're too close or um, they're feeling threatened, they do spray it. And it is a very overwhelming smell. If it gets on your skin, it can irritate your skin. If it goes in your eyes, it actually causes temporary blindness in some people, wow. which is pretty crazy. So we also, when we're um, physically working with them, I have eye protection that I wear, a mask. Uh, which normally I do have to wear an N95 with them. So that's a pretty good mask to keep that venom from uh, me breathing it in. And I also wear leather gloves. So besides for our rattlesnake, this is probably one of the animals that we use the most protection when working with. That's crazy. And you just answered a whole bunch of questions because lots of people ask, can they eat humans? Can they harm humans? So I think you covered all that. I'm guessing they don't eat humans, but definitely it can be a pretty... Uh, nasty bite, it sounds like. Yes, they can um, eat humans, but like you just said, Karen, it is a bad bite. And they know that too. When the um, white spot assassin is, is looking at a human or at a predator that's bigger than it, it's using that proboscis, that, that rostrum to, to defend itself. It knows it's not going to be able to eat you. So its goal is just to defend you, to defend itself. As you can expect, we always get these questions. Uh, in this case, Will, who just had a birthday and is now eight years old, wants to know what their names are. <gasps> Love that question. Well, happy birthday to first start out with. Uh, so currently at the museum, we have a hundred adult white assassin bugs. And that's not including our babies that we have in the back. So these guys, they all look very similar. So we don't name them. 
Um, but like always, I love to hear name suggestions. So if you have some good white spot, white spot assassin bug names, throw them out there. Oh my God, and we have so many questions, but I, I know we still have two other animals that we wanna meet. So how about this one? This is a good one. Are the spots some kind of warning? That's a great question. So they are, they tend to mimic other animals, um, but the, those white spots, or I should say other animals tend to mimic their white spots. Those white spots do let predators know, hey, I'm venomous. Um, I'm not gonna taste good. You're gonna get hurt if you come near me. So that is such a great observation. There are other animals that use those, those white dots um, to mimic that same, that same um, warning. These guys also, it's a little hard to tell coloration wise, but on their legs, they have yellow bands. And that yellow, like red, are bright warning colors that say, hey, you don't wanna eat me. Great, somebody asked why they had yellow legs. So you just answered two questions in one. I think we should probably move on to our next friend. So everybody can say goodbye to our white spotted assassin beetles. Oh wait, and I forgot, I have my, my back slide to share with you. Sorry about that. You guys want to take maybe a screenshot or a quick snap with your phone. That's a lot of the information, including that real cool fact about how they pee. I think we're just swapping out between Corey and Liz and they will be right back. I think we are just about ready. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. All right, so you guys met an insect with a unique defense. I next wanted to introduce you to a reptile with a unique defense. So with that being said, I'm gonna have Corey turn on the camera for our reptile. This is one that you probably will be kind of familiar with. You might not know exactly what it is, but you probably are thinking it's some type of lizard and you would be absolutely correct. This is a lizard called a chuckwalla. Now that name used to always make me giggle. I've gotten used to it in the years that I've taken care of this animal, but it is kind of a funny name for a lizard. Now chuckwallas are actually native to the United States. A lot of times people are surprised by that. Now they are actually the second largest lizard you can find in the United States. Now, sometimes people are surprised by that too, because she's impressive, but she's not enormous. Now, the largest lizard in the United States is one called the Gila monster. That's actually a venomous lizard. Chuckwallas are non-venomous. Now, full size, you might see a really big one up to about 15 inches long. She's probably not quite that long. And you will notice their tail makes up a pretty good portion of their length. Now chuckwallas, there are actually six different species of chuckwallas and they're actually in the iguana family. Most of you have probably heard of iguanas before. Now I mentioned they are United States residents. You won't find them unfortunately here in the New England area, but you will find them in deserts in southwestern parts of the United States, Sonoran and Mojave deserts. Now their preferred habitat is actually really dry, rocky, what are known as arid regions. So that's where gonna, you're gonna find them most often. Now we said the title of our show is Unique Defenses. So you guys have probably been looking at her thinking, what could her unique defense be? Maybe she's really, really fast. Maybe chuckwallas are extremely fast lizards, maybe like geckos that are often known for speed. Now, they're not gonna win any races with lizards. They're not extremely slow, but they're not the fastest. So it's not that. They also technically can bite, they can scratch. We like to say anything with mouths is capable of biting, but that's not really their defense either. And their claws, while kind of impressive, are more for moving up rocks and things like that, rather than scratching in defense. Now, some of you may have heard that some lizards as a defense can drop or break off their tails. Those of you that haven't heard that, it might sound crazy for a piece of your body to break off, but a lot of lizards have long tails. If the tail can be broken off when a predator grabs onto it, 
it gives the lizard a chance to get away. And then the predator is left with a wriggly tail. Typically lizards with that defense can regenerate or regrow that tail. How cool is that? Might not be quite as long, might not be the same exact color, still a pretty neat defense that many lizards have. Now I did want to explain that unique defense of lizards. However, the chuckwalla does not have that defense. So now you're probably thinking, all right, what does this lizard do? What unique defense does it have? I think it's a lot more interesting than some of the other things I mentioned. What this lizard does is it trots pretty quickly if a predator is coming after it. It runs into a rocky crevice, so it finds a little hole, and it gulps air, inflates its body so it's a lot bigger than it was, and it stays put. So the animal that's trying to eat the chuckwalla literally cannot get the chuckwalla out of the rocky crevice it just went in. They might try to pull, they might try to yank it out, but the chuckwalla has now increased in size and cannot be pulled from the rocky crevice. How cool is that? Most animals will just move on and find something a little bit easier to eat. So it's a really neat defense that does actually work for the chuckwalla. Now I see we have lots of questions, Karen. So why don't I turn it over to some of those? Yes, I will try to sort of filter through. Um, one that I'm curious about, you mentioned it's the second largest lizard next to the Gila monster, mm -hmm. and it is in the iguana family. What about those really giant iguanas in Florida? Are they not native to the United States? Is that where the difference comes in? Yes. So those, I believe, are just an invasive species. So you're right, they probably do get larger. Um, but just like invasive snakes, we often don't think of them as being native animals. Um, so yes, you would potentially see invasive lizards. I guess I should have clarified our native species of lizards, it is the second largest. <laughs> um, so a couple of people were asking about its wrinkly skin. Why does it look like fabric? Does it have a purpose? Maybe you can explain a little bit more about their skin. A lot of that loose skin that you're seeing is actually where that defense comes into play. So they have lots of loose wrinkly skin folds because they need to be able to inflate and get bigger when they gulp that air. So yeah, a lot of that wrinkly skin is just that defense. Uh, and then we have a bunch of questions and sort of grouping them together about their prey. So what do they eat? Sort of how do they catch their food that they're eating? That's a great question. For the most part, they are actually herbivores. So that means they eat only vegetation. So they eat things like plants, leaves, flowers, fruits. Um, so they don't actually hunt really. Occasionally they are known to eat an insect if they come across it and they're really hungry, but their favorite things to eat are gonna be fruits and things they don't really have to hunt for. Shrubs, plants. Our chakwala here at the museum actually does sometimes like to eat bugs. One of her favorite things is we sometimes give her wax worms as treats. But most of her diet is actually a salad of mixed greens and a bunch of different fruits and vegetables. Excellent. So we'll take a couple more about our chakwala before we move on to our final animal. Nerla, who is 11, says, since their eyes are pretty big, can they see very well? They have decent vision, and from what I've read, they do have some limited color vision, um, but I don't think they have, they don't have the best of the best in terms of vision. Um, and again, they're not really hunters, so they don't need to have the best vision. Like typically predators have those forward-facing eyes, um, so we have good depth perception. Uh, so they don't necessarily need to have the best vision like that. Um, but from what I've read, they have pretty decent vision. And there have been lots of questions coming in, this one specifically from 10-year-old Maddie about their colors. So Maddie asks, why do they only come in black and brown? Other people were asking, do they come in other colors? Why are they these colors? Do they camouflage in their habitat? This definitely would afford them some camouflage. These colors would blend in really well with rocks in those dry regions uh, of the desert. Um, well, that's actually an interesting point though. The males are much more brightly colored. So this one is a female. You might see a male that has a lot more red, kind of alongside his, uh, kind of his trunk, his midsection. It would be much more red. 
sometimes you'll even see some shades of yellow. Um, so it is sometimes the case that an animal's males are more brightly colored and chuck wallas are one such example. Although I personally think our female is pretty attractive, uh, the males generally are much brighter colored. All right, Colin, age nine, wants to know, have you ever seen her inflate? I haven't seen her completely do it. I have read stories at other zoos that they've had to completely rip apart an exhibit because a chuck walla went into a crevice and inflated <laughs> and they had to do that to get it out. I've never seen her do it completely. Occasionally I've seen her puff up a little bit, maybe if she's not overly happy with something that's happening, but I've never seen her wedge into something. Uh, so I guess that's good that we're not getting her stressed out to the point that she feels like she needs to. And then I think we should, have, even though there are so many questions and they're all really excellent, but lots of people want to know what is her name and how old is she? I always wait for those questions. Her name is Rocky and she is actually turning 11 years old this year. So she's about, uh, I would say, close to middle-aged for a chuckwalla. They are known to live 20, even 25 years in captivity. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing the chuckwalla, Rocky, with us all. Our friends will say goodbye to Rocky. I will share my screen with some fun facts about the chuckwalla. I can see, again, where they live, remind yourself, and how long they can live, which is, you know, for captive lizard that feels pretty long but maybe it's not always good to know how long your potential pet may live um, before you get them so just let me know Liz when we're ready to move I on I think we are about ready okay so you guys have met an insect you've met a reptile I wanted to finish with a mammal with a unique defense so with that I'm going to have Corey turn the camera on now this one is playing a little bit, so he might be hard for her to track down, but there is most of his body up on camera. So you guys are probably seeing this animal and you immediately have an idea of what it is. I'm sure there's lots of guesses of armadillo and you would be absolutely correct. This is a specific kind of armadillo called a screaming hairy armadillo. I'm not joking you, that is the technical name of this animal. Now, armadillos are pretty recognizable for a mammal. They are covered in armor. That word armadillo means little armored one. And they are covered in those bony plates that help protect them. However, there are lots of different kinds of armadillos. This is a full grown screaming hairy armadillo. They do live in parts of South America. We have a larger armadillo native to the United States called the nine-banded armadillo. So you guys are probably looking at him and you're thinking, all right, unique defense. They have those bony plates covering their body. They have that protection. All right, we get it. That's pretty cool. However, it's not quite as simple as that. Screaming hairy armadillos have several unique defenses. So the first thing they are going to do, if they are threatened, a predator is coming after them, they are gonna run pretty quickly and burrow, dig underground. Uh, he actually just did a pretty good example of it. He didn't have to dig, but he went into a tunnel. So they are really fast diggers. They could be underground in a matter of seconds. So that is the first thing they are going to try to get away. Now, the next thing they are going to do they will rely a little bit on that armor, on that protection that they have. Now they can't completely curl their bodies up into a ball. There's actually only one kind of armadillo that can completely curl up. It's called a three banded armadillo. Some of the bands on their bodies are movable. You might be able to see a little bit of that getting that close up look right now. So they can tuck their bodies up a little bit, but they can't completely curl up. So some of their underside, which is softer, would definitely still be exposed. So that's the second thing they can rely on, using their armor. Now the third thing, you guys probably got a hint at what this unique defense is by the name of the animal. Remember I called it the screaming hairy armadillo? If something grabs onto this animal, 
or really messes with it, they will let out a very loud, shrill scream. I'm not gonna imitate it for you because I'm not very good at it. And he unfortunately won't do it on command. Uh, it kind of sounds like a screaming toddler. I've heard some people compare it to a squealing pig. Uh, I'm sure if you go onto YouTube, uh, I know the video years ago was up. If you just type in screaming hairy armadillo, you will come across some pretty funny sound files. It is a very startling sudden noise to come from an animal of this size. And the idea is it's startling enough that whatever was messing with the armadillo will drop it and move on because they're scared enough by that crazy scream. Now I see we have a ton of questions and only a little bit of time left. So I better turn over to some of those. Excellent. I think it would make a really great uh, like alarm wake you up in the morning. It's like a squealing pig and a toddler put together. So it would be a terrifying alarm, but yes, it would it be, but would. it would wake you up for sure. Um, so let's start right off the bat. What is his name? How old is he? And is he full grown? Uh, yes, he is full grown. Uh, he is actually only about seven months old. He was born here at the museum. We were very excited about that. His name is Boots. And his parents are Dora and Diego. Um, so in regards to the hairs, why is it hairy? Does it have a reason for having the hair? Yeah, so being a mammal, all armadillos are covered in hair to some extent. That is a characteristic of being a mammal, is having hair at some point in the development. Hairy armadillos are called hairy armadillos because they tend to be a little bit hairier than some of the other kinds of armadillos. A lot of that hair can be used for sensation. Uh, think of whiskers on some animals. If they're in a tunnel or they're somewhere dark and they can't see as well, the whiskers kind of give them a sense of where they are. Those hairs can work. Uh, actually, he's doing a good uh, demonstration of it right now. As he moves around within this cloth tunnel, imagine him doing that underground. Kind of help him feel a little bit more. All right, so Maria wants to know, can they lay eggs? And Luis says, can they have babies? Um, so yes, like I said, he was a baby here at the museum. So his parents uh, did, did have him. Um, they do not lay eggs. Um, there are some egg laying mammals, we call those monotremes, um, but they are what are known as a placental mammal. So just like dogs and cats, uh, they do give birth to live young. They typically have two babies, uh, usually a boy and a girl. Um, we were just blessed with one, our, our little boots here. So we were very happy with him, but it's usually two. All right, and another good one. Um, what does it eat, asks Lila, almost age nine. Here at the museum, a lot of the diet of our armadillos is actually a dry kibble that's made for animals that eat a lot of insects in the wild. So I guess that gives you a clue as to what they mostly eat in the wild. It's mostly gonna be bugs. They are able to catch some small animals, maybe small lizards, um, maybe small mice even, but mostly it's going to be insects. Um, they are technically omnivores. So you might also find them eating some vegetation, plants that they come across. They also are not above eating dead animals. They are known to eat dead things that they find. All right, and we are just about out of time, but one last question. Are they nocturnal and do they see well at night? That's a good question. They actually change their behavior. They are either diurnal, mean, meaning active during the day, or nocturnal, depending on the season. So in their habitat, when it's really, really hot, they actually will switch and they'll mostly sleep during the hot time and be active more at night. So they actually will vary their activity based on the season. And they have pretty decent eyesight. Um, not the best of the best, but certainly not the worst. All right, so there is your sort of fact sheet about our screaming hairy armadillo. And that is an adorable picture. I think that is of Boots himself. Um, so you can again, take a screenshot of that uh, just to remember all the cool facts about our screaming hairy armadillo. But I wanna thank Thank Liz and Corey and our white spotted assassin bugs and our Chuckwalla Rocky and our screaming hairy armadillo boots for joining us today. So Liz, you can give a wave and say farewell. 
Bye, guys. Don't worry, they'll all be back next week, guys. Um, I also want to thank you. Let me bring up my video. There we go. I want to thank you guys for coming out today and joining us for our live animal presentation. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I even learned some great new fun facts about those different species of animals. These happen every Friday at one o'clock, so certainly continue to tune back in. I love that it looks like we had several different classrooms tuning in today, so welcome to all of our students joining today as well. If this is something that you enjoyed and have the ability to do so, we would love your support, and you can go to mos.org slash science matters uh, in order to support the museum in what we are doing. So thank you so much for your time today, and we'll see you next time.